Welcome, John. Hey, everybody. Hi, Adam. Welcome to all of you. <clears throat> Vegas, baby. OK, they're not ready yet, I, I don't, don't think. think they're ready. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, since you, uh, you need some waking up, we were, we're going to show you a quick video about Waymo, please. Like there's a ghost, a ghost at the steering wheel. I kind of feel like royalty being paraded around in this thing. School zone. Look at these guys. <laughs> Looking over. Are they? <laughs> no driver. No. What? This little way more thing is cruising. <laughs> oh, it's a pretty sharp turn. They made it pretty smoothly. Say thank you. We're here. We made it. And I didn't have to drive. So, um, yeah, what do you think? John, those people looked incredibly happy. They, yeah, they were, they were happy campers. So, first of all, what that was um, were some of the first riders um, in Phoenix who were enjoying a truly driverless experience um, in the Waymo car. So we wanted to give you a sense of, of what it felt like to actually be in a Waymo uh, that was moving around the streets of Phoenix with absolutely no human uh, in the driver's seat. How many people in this room have ridden in a fully autonomous car like that? OK, this is an unusual audience in, in that respect. In that res well, I don't believe that. <laughs> All right, we, um... <laughs> Wait a minute, I need to talk to all of you who raised your hand after the meeting. Uh, we need to have a chat. We, um, we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I was sort of shocked when I realized that Waymo is 11 years old. Yeah. Started as a Google moonshot. Um, when you and I talked for the first time, you told me it's not a moonshot anymore. Explain that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, um, Adam, because I think it's important for all of us to have um, that context. Um, our work um, back then, which started at Google, um, we're now part of Alphabet and not part of Google specifically, um, that work started in 2009. And the goal at that time was to land uh, a moonshot. And I would say we did that in 2015. It took us six years um, to actually get to the point where we were confident enough to put on public roads a car of our own design. You might know it as the little koala car. We knew it internally as Firefly. Um, a car on the streets of Austin, Texas, that moved from a point A to a random point B um, with a blind, non-licensed human in the car and no safety net. There were no driver controls. There were no emergency stop buttons in the car. Um, we consider that the moonshot. And the vocabulary there, I think, is important because we all know what moonshots are. And we think of things like um, the Apollo missions and landing um, someone on the moon in 1969. What we don't think a lot about when we use that term moonshot is um, actually in those cases, in particular uh, some of these space missions, there's, there's quite a high uh, level of probability of some catastrophic failure. Um, and, and therefore, a moonshot isn't really appropriate for something that you want to deliver millions of every day, which is Waymo's intention uh, with driverless rides, right? So we had to move beyond moonshot thinking, which got us to 2015, um, to this new sort of thinking where we're scaling, um, where we're able to do this over and over again with very high confidence of perfect outcomes every time. For me, moonshot connotes something, uh, something else, which is um, you know sort of low probability of success, but if the success happens, it's a really great success, but maybe not a great business proposition. That's and right. I think the point you're also trying to make is that you intend for this to be a great business proposition, even if it isn't yet. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. And um, again, just continuing with that timeline. So 2015, we did one of these rides, and we said, wow, you know, what a great moment. This was the Katie Hawk moment for autonomous driving. Interestingly, um, we're not aware of anyone having done that since. 
um, our 2015 ride, a fully driverless car um, with no human able to take over in the car. We don't think that's been done since. Think about that. That's five years ago. Well, in no, fact, whether or not it's been done since in any sort of testing environment, there is no other operator that is doing that. That's right. With real humans, meaning, with, I'm sorry, with real passengers. With real passengers. I met right. the passengers, and we you met are. The passengers. What gave you the confidence yeah. to do that? So this is, this is getting to scaling and, and repeatability. So we did that one ride in 2015. It took us two more years to completely redo the hardware suite install it in the Chrysler Pacifica vans that we're using now in our service, and get three people riding at the same time in Phoenix in fully driverless fashion. So it took six years to get one done. It took another two years to get three people um, riding simultaneously. It took another year to get 100 cars up and running simultaneously in Phoenix. That was 2018. And it's taken us really this next year and a half or so, the second half of 2019 was the time where we were confident enough to on a daily basis um, put our riders into these cars enjoying this experience with no human intervention. Okay, so um, I, I, wanna, I want us to talk as much as possible, bef before I get to your questions, uh, about the the business of Waymo. Yeah. So first thing, 11 years, started as Moonshot, figuring out the business model now. How much money in total has Alphabet invested in Waymo? A lot, um, a lot of money. Um, <laughs> just, I want to leave it at that. A lot of money uh, lot is what of I money. spent to fly to Las Vegas today, <laughs> but I think that's a different order of magnitude. Um, a, a lot of money, and then there's also a lot that comes as a benefit of being part of Alphabet. For example, um, we do a lot of driving. How much driving do we do? I, I do want to share a point. We, we hit a bit of a milestone recently um, at the end of last year. Um, the last we had talked about the number of miles we'd driven on public roads, um, we said 10 million. Um, and it took us 10 years to drive those 10 million miles. In about the last year or so, we've driven another 10 million miles. So the news that we're sharing with you guys tonight, you're the first to know, outside of Waymo is that, is that we're now beyond um, 20 million miles of fully self-driving, like really self-driving. You said 20 million miles, miles. you meant 20 million rides, I think, right? 20 million That's miles. Miles, miles. okay. Uh -huh. 20 million miles. Um, but backing up those 20 million miles are tens of billions of simulated miles. And getting to the cost of doing this it would be hard for any company other than a company like Google to deliver that level of simulation capability to help solve this problem. Um, you really need to have both in this business. You need to have a lot of real world experience. There's no way to avoid that. You must have it, but you need to supplement it with the simulation miles. And those two things work together synergistically to help us improve our algorithm, our software, so that we can drive safely. John, what exactly does simulated miles mean? Can you explain that? Yeah, so um, what we do is we take our experience in real world driving and move that up into a simulation model where we make the situations we encountered in the real world even more challenging. We call this fuzzing, but we take real world situations that we experienced and move the cars even closer, make the speeds even faster, and then test the Waymo driver in that simulated world to see if it can still perform in even more extreme conditions. That's how we're able to improve our software so quickly, and it's really the main engine of software improvement for us at Waymo. But we couldn't do that without tens of millions of miles of real world experience to inform that simulated driving. So to be clear, other than a lot, you're not gonna say how much the company has invested in this project. It's a lot, billions. Billions? Billions, absolutely. Three to five, five to 10. What's the next question? Are there any audience questions <laughs> at this point? Okay, tell everybody exactly what Waymo One is, the, 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 the well, I don't, the project, the, the, the service you're running in the Phoenix area. Yeah, and, and, and putting that into context, because you asked about commercialization, and we've really got four different business lines um, that we're working on right, right now. The first is um, ride hailing, so uh, a service very similar to what you'd experience with Uber or Lyft or Didi, um, where you hail a car um, with your Waymo app, and it comes to pick you up and drives you wherever you want to go in our service area. Um, right now in Phoenix, um, this Waymo One, which you're talking about, um, uh, serves an area larger than the city of San Francisco. It's a very substantially sized area in the southeast 
uh, corner of Phoenix. And in that area, you can drive anywhere you want to from point A to point B um, using the Waymo app. Um, we also have a, um, three other business lines. Um, one of them is urban delivery. So using those same vehicles that we're employing in Phoenix uh, to move goods from point A to point B. We also have um, long distance trucking, which is a very interesting business and a rather out obvious op application of the Waymo driver to heavy trucks uh, to move um, lots of goods from point A to point B, primarily on highways. Um, and then of course, our automaker partners are very interested in deploying our technology in some sort of personal use um, application. So we're working with them uh, on a way to, op to sort of unlock that potential. Um. Tell us a little more about a Waymo One. For example, how many um, how many customers are there? How much do you charge? You charge some people, not others, uh, I think. And yeah. when are you going to expand out of that market? So you've got about 1,500 now monthly active users um, who are using the service um, uh, on, on a regular basis. Many of them use it every day uh, to get to and from work and, and do whatever errands or things they might have to do in the Phoenix area. So these people are living the full-on Jetsons experience. They are summoning a robot car to come get them and take them. It's places. awesome, yeah, and it's, it's happening in Southeast Phoenix right now. What are they doing? And uh, the charge for that is very similar to um, what you would experience with an UberX or uh, the basic Lyft ride. Um, but for that, you're getting um, this rather extraordinary experience. And you're also getting a uniformity of experience. So all of our vehicles right now will be adding new cars to the fleet soon. But right now, you know you'll be getting a very safe five-star um, Chrysler Pacifica with a leather interior and a great sound system. You can enjoy Google Play Music and other features inside <laughs> the vehicle. You I laugh, but that's not that. a trivial, that, that's not just a throwaway comment. That's, that's relevant, right? These cars are opportunities to show Google products, be on the Google platform, right? I think the, the primary focus really of Waymo truly is to build the world's most experienced driver. Um, there will be other opportunities, I think, to, to do things like this, but it's the best music service. Why wouldn't we deploy it um, inside the Waymo? I, I don't know. Um, right now, you can, hail, you, can hail the, you can go on your Lyft app uh, to, re mm. to request one. That's right. I, um, I asked you when you're going to be expanding them outside of the Phoenix area, and when and you do, will you also be able to do it through Lyft? Yes, um, so right now we have a pilot with Lyft where um, you can hail a Waymo through the Lyft app, that's terrific. That so far is only available in Phoenix. Um, we're considering um, moving that into other cities. Um, and we'll also be moving, of course, the Waymo One service to, to other cities. And one, one place that you might imagine we would launch is California, uh, where we've had a lot of driving um, experience. The, the, the places we've driven the most are in California and Arizona. Um, and we have a lot of experience driving in the Bay Area, um, a lot of experience driving in San Francisco. Um, right now, um, we have permits to drive, but we don't have permits to um, to deliver revenue. Um, we can't charge for rides in California. We're working with the California Public Utility Commission um, so that they can get more comfortable with, um, with the service. You, um, you made some comments late last year that suggested that long haul trucking delivery could be a better, uh, could be a, a, a sooner commercial opportunity than ride hailing. Is that yeah. an accurate paraphrase and do you still think that? Um, well, it, it turns out that ride hailing won, right? So we're, we're generating revenue right now through autonomous ride hailing, but um, commercial trucking, I think, will follow relatively closely. What's interesting about commercial trucking is right now, it is a bigger market opportunity than ride hailing. If you just looked at the size of that sector um, and the revenue that's available just in the US, there's more in commercial trucking than there is in ride hailing. Um, however, as we make our projections going forward, I'm sure Leon has made similar projections at City uh, and others of you in the industry have as well, you understand that as, um, as you enjoy the benefits of drivers like Waymo, which have lower cost and higher efficiency, um, then we can imagine lower cost per mile um, and that elasticity we think is going to be quite strong and is going to drive ride hailing to, for example, by 2030 to be substantially larger industry than commercial trucking is right now. But right now as it sits, there's more opportunity as we sit here in 2020 in commercial trucking than there is at ride hailing at current price structure. And um, about how big is, well, if I ask you how much revenue you're bringing in, you're not going to say, correct? Correct. <laughs> That's a good guess. 
when do you, when does Waymo need to be a real business? If we assume you've invested billions of dollars, you're bringing in de minimis amounts of revenue compared yeah. to that. Yeah. When will that, when will be, when will we be able to change that equation? I think the important thing in a business like this one is to look at the unit economics that your business is able to deliver. Um, so of course we've been investing over a long period of time um, because we had a lot of certainty that this was going to deliver a lot of social good for the world. It's terrible that we live in a world that experiences 1.35 million fatalities on roadways globally um, every year. That's like uh, 737 crashing every hour of every day. If this were happening in the aviation industry, we would say, no, we should stop. Um, but yet we accept, accept it for some reason um, in, in the ground transportation business, and we really shouldn't. So we've had a lot of faith that there would be a strong economic payback in time, uh, but that we would need a very long horizon um, to take as we pursued that path. So I think in time, all those good things are going to come. Um, the thing that we look at short term is um, how do the unit economics look? We can't really think about the, the sunk cost of the past. Great, and so in my last question, you said it's interesting, the, you said by 2030 you think the ride hailing, the, the auto, autonomous ride hailing business will be bigger than the other opportunities, or at least than bigger uh, yeah, than long haul trucks. On, on the way to that, for sure, but by 2030 for sure. So the big auto companies also believe that Auto 2.0, that the, their big opportunity is service revenue. Waymo thinks service revenue is, is a big opportunity. Right now you have a small handful of some of the not biggest auto companies in the world as your partners. Do you need more auto company partners than you have? You have Jaguar, Land Rover, uh, uh, FCA, Renault. Yeah. Um I think it's a great question. I think we need to think about things from um, the car company's perspective a lot. And um, one, of the, one of the challenges in the auto industry is the profitability of the industry. So uh, a typical car um, globally sells for about $30,000. That's about average revenue. And a car company does well if they make $1,500 um, profit from that car. It may not seem horrible. Uh, it's like a 5% uh, To Google, that's sales. pretty horrible. Uh, but it's a, it's a very capital intensive industry and it's one of the reasons why automotive uh, multiples are as low as they are, right? Um, when you do the math though on that $1,500 profit divided by 150,000 miles of average lifetime for a car, you find that car companies are making about a penny per mile. Um, the current business model of selling cars one at a time, and by the way, that penny per mile includes all current service revenue and parts revenue, um, it's not a very good business, mm. right? Mm. And so one of the things that we offer to our partners is an opportunity to do much better than a penny per mile in a car as a service uh, sort of business application. Um, certainly from our standpoint, in terms of the capacity we need to provide the cars we need and the services we imagine deploying, we have all the, all the support and capacity we need. Um, but if car companies would enjoy having Waymo as a driver, because we're not a car company, right? Um, we're not a car company. We're, we're even not a self-driving car company. We're, we're a technology company. Mm -hmm. Our product is drivers. Um, and I think we all need to practice. This year should be all of our New Year's resolution in 2020. For those of you who raised your hand and said you have driven in a self-driving car, I really don't think you have. And we should talk about that because you really haven't. Um, as far as we know, there's really only one of those running right now and it's in Phoenix. And maybe all of you were in the early service, but I don't think you were. Um, so we have to get our language right. You know, there are cars with driver assistance out there that you can buy, um, but they're not self-driving cars. They're truly not. And that, that language difference is so important. It's really important for the safety in, in the lives of many, many people. So we have to get better at this, right? There are cars with driver assistance. There are no self-driving cars available. But you know, I haven't done any scientific, scientific research, but most of these people live in, in New York or San Francisco, and you're not planning on going there anytime soon, are you? New York or San Francisco? Why not? I don't know, you tell me. Are you planning <laughs> on going to New York or San Francisco? We're driving in San Francisco now. But not with, not with, not with paying uh, passengers? No, well, that's, that's one of the things we're working through with CPUC. Yeah. Your questions. Uh, we have we have we have mics that are roving that we'll give you if you you want to ask. I have one right there. Please, please identify yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Joel Meyer, CEO of VacuWeather. So, there's no snow in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> he is an authority on this question. <laughs> what, what I will not question your credentials. You know what the question is: <clears throat> What happens when it gets uh, 
into a snow area? Thank that's you, a, That's a great question. And it's, it's, of course, one of the reasons why we chose Phoenix as the first um, launch market. Just as, for those of you with teenage kids, I had a couple. Um, I taught them how to drive. I did not teach them how to drive on really snowy days in Michigan. Um, but the Waymo driver needs to learn how to handle bad weather. So I was mentioning to Leon, we were storm chasing earlier this year. We sent a couple of cars to Miami uh, during the hurricanes, and um, we sent um, uh, we have a whole fleet of cars, 10 or 15 cars, maybe more, in Michigan right now, and we enjoy lots of the Michigan weathers, and we go up to the Upper Peninsula to make sure that we have um, lots of experience in snow and ice. But that comes later for us, right? We want to deploy safely. There are so many markets that we can deliver our service where the weather is great most of the time. That's where we should launch first and then move into more challenging weather conditions later. Yes, back there, please. There's Mike. Hello, so I'm Julia Landauer, and I'm a race car driver. And I get the question, how do I feel? Your about job it? is safe. Okay. <laughs> I Don't worry. For now, but from a technological standpoint, in terms of developing cars that can go on the road and follow the rules of the road, how does that compare with, you know, building something that is meant to optimize the vehicle and to go all out, you know, at the absolute maximum of what the grip can do? Is that something that is easily developed? Is it harder? It's, um, it's a, it's, I would say it's the same sort of engineering challenge, right? So I don't know if you've heard the old expression that it's harder to design a Chevrolet than a Mercedes Benz. This is an old one. Um, but it, when you have a cost target, um, as a Chevrolet might have a tougher cost target than a very expensive car, mm. there's still that same engineering value challenge that you have to deliver. Um, so when you think about a car, now I'm not talking about the Waymo driver. I think. The development of the Waymo driver is probably the most complicated thing any company has ever tried to do. I, I'm pretty sure that's the case. It's extremely complicated. Cars are extremely complicated as well. Um, to design a car that would work well with the Waymo driver, I think would be a difficult um, and similar challenge to designing a very high performance race car. Um, for example, we would, we would want um, really great passive safety characteristics. Um, we would want a vehicle that lasted a very, very long time, like four or 500,000 miles, whereas a race car really only has to race mm. or only has to last one mile longer um, than the length of your race. You know? So uh, different kinds of challenges. If, if I could paraphrase, almost, there's almost an analogy to precision medicine. Like you could be developing a drug that would benefit five people, but instead you're trying to develop a drug for millions of people. It's a great analogy. There's a question behind the flowers over there. Maybe you could walk out to where John can see you, if you like, or just ask it from where you sure. are. Sure. No, 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 no. I'll totally walk over Thank here, you. friends. Hey. hey. Hello. Hi, Adam. Hi, John. Hi, Stacy. Introduce <laughs> um, yourself, please, quickly. Yes. Oh, yes. Stacy Randucker, Flying Car Show. Lots of questions, but I'll be brief. So first, later this evening, we're going to hear from Salita Reynolds. John, have you met Salita? <laughs> I think my team has. OK. You need to meet her. Thank you. Um, the reason why is she is all about cities, yeah. and I love cities, and I love Waymo, and I want you guys to get <laughs> So, um, what will you participate in mobility as a service? Meaning, will you open up Waymo's platform, and will it be available to cities to incorporate into a larger application that would be available for everyone? Or will you be a walled garden? Yeah, okay, good. And then the next one is, what is your dream for cities? What do you want to bring to cities that we don't have already? Let's focus on the, on the first one. Is that your, is the, is the business model that Stacy described, Waymo's yeah. business model? So we believe very strongly that there's so much great infrastructure in cities um, for public transportation right now, but we are just not using it well enough. And one of the problems is sometimes it's hard for us humans to get to um, that existing public transportation. And so we've already engaged in discussions with cities about using the Waymo driver to help solve that problem. We can help move people um, from where they work or live to existing public transportation infrastructure hubs. We can do that very well. We can also deploy the Waymo driver in service of um, existing public transportation utilities like buses. There's no reason why Waymo couldn't drive um, a bus and do a very good job at that. There's no There's reason why. Resoundingly, yes. Okay, resoundingly, yes, but it doesn't sound like it's on the near term game plan. You have other things on the, that you're well, working I mean, on our, next our, month. Our primary focus is, is really, it's in service of all of these things. So 
Like it, in many cases, I think in this space, we run a little bit ahead of ourselves and we imagine all the applications. But if you don't have a driver that works, you don't have anything. And so Waymo's focus has appropriately, I think, been on making the world's most experienced driver. Once we have that, mm. it's fairly easy and mechanical to apply it to a car, to a truck, to a van, to a bus. John, before we go, um, you didn't answer my question earlier about whether or not Waymo needs and wants and will have more automotive partners. You don't have any of the biggest auto companies in the world as your partners because they're getting a cent a mile, but they want way more, you want way more. They haven't bit yet, other yeah. than the several I mentioned. I think we have the partners that we like. I think some of the car companies have decided this is such an important thing to learn and understand that they want to try it on their own. And, and we've said to all of these car companies, uh, we think that's an okay thing to do. And, and if it doesn't work out for you, um, we'll be here. And, and we're happy to drive <laughs> for any car company. John, uh, we're super appreciative that you came here tonight. We are going to serve our first course and then have more entertainment that I hope will be as enjoyable as John Kraftcheck, CEO of Waymo. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks, Adam. That's great. Good fun.